Welcome to our worship and the celebration of Holy Trinity Sunday. Let us begin. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth shall declare your praise. Make haste, O God, to deliver me. Make haste to help me, O Lord. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. Praise to you, O Christ. Alleluia. Blessed be God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. O come, let us worship him. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. The deep places of the earth are in his hand. The strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hand formed the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Blessed be God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. O come, let us worship him. Amen. A reading from Acts, the second chapter. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades, or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would see set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, the Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. A reading from uh, St. Matthew, the 28th chapter. Now the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the very end of the age. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly set in the heavens. Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Grace, mercy, and peace be yours from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. A while back, I was watching a very popular mega church preacher talking for more than half an hour about a God who is all-powerful and, 
and is directing every aspect of our lives to give us whatever we want to make us happy. Unfortunately, such blessings can only be secured if this God is lassoed, hogtied, and coerced by our positive attitudes to do so. Throughout this man's sermon, I did not hear Jesus' name mentioned once, not once. Yet at the end of his message, he encouraged the hearers to invite Jesus into their hearts. Now, after hearing such a Christless message, many a hearer who, was, who, who might have been asking, uh, to, as they were, to turn their life over to Jesus, they might have been wondering, well, who is this Jesus guy? That question has been asked by people ever since Jesus walked among us. Most agree that he was an influential figure in the history of the world. But is he only a wise and moral man? Just another of the world's many charismatic religious leaders? Or just an advocate for a change in social order? Today in our epistle, we are given the answer to who Jesus really is from the perspective of the Holy Trinity. See, one of the first things that Peter tells us is that Jesus is the man who fulfilled the purpose of God the Father. From eternity, God had a purpose in mind for the people that he would create in his image. It had always been his plan that we should be like him in holiness and, and in our walk and our desire. He created us to live in perfect fellowship with him through worship and obedience, to know his love and to love him in return. When sin entered the world, however, it was as if someone put a can of fluorescent orange spray paint in the hands of an insane person, let them loose in an art museum. We have effectively ruined the work of the master, wildly splattering our own ugly color of sin over his masterpiece and pretending that we have produced a better work. All of us, like the rioters of this last week, who destroyed and defaced buildings and damaged lives, just keep on going around with a spray can of sin in hand to do the same toward God and his work. On the surface, it may seem that nothing could be done to restore such a glorious work, but God the Father loves the people he created so much that he would not rest until everything was made right again. Already in the Garden of Eden, while Adam and Eve stood shamefully holding their own fig-leafed shaped spray cans in front of them, God announced his plan to fulfill his purpose. He would send a perfect man to be born of a woman to crush this head of Satan for them. Throughout the Old Testament, God repeated this promise to send a savior who would be a man to take our place in fulfilling God's purpose of holiness and love. But it was not enough that this man should live for us. It was also part of God's plan that this perfect man should share the Father's love for us, that he would love us so much that he would willingly sacrifice himself for our sins. So from before the creation of the world, God planned for an innocent man to die on the cross as our substitute, to receive the punishment that our sins rightly deserve. Peter announces that Jesus of Nazareth was that perfect man who was delivered up, crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men, not by some unfortunate accident or miscarriage of justice, but according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, the Father. When the question is asked, who is Jesus? We can answer, he is the one who became man to live and die among us according to the Father's plan and purpose. Jesus is truly a man who was tempted like us in every way, even more severely. There is an old spiritual which cries out, nobody knows the troubles I see, nobody knows but Jesus. And what a comfort it, it must have been for the slaves who originally sang that song. They suffered in ways we could never imagine, but through it all, they knew that Jesus understood. In the same way, Jesus knows all the troubles that we see in our lives. He knows what you and I experience every day as we are attacked by the devil 
and all his agents of deception in this world. He understands the desires of the flesh and the needs of the body that inflame us. He is familiar with the way the world tempts us to swallow us up and to keep us from fulfilling God's purpose for us. He is the man who experienced all our feelings and all our emotions. He knows what it is to be hated by the people he loved. He knows what it is to be hurt by the betrayal and rejection of others. He has felt the same joys and sorrows, the same happiness and sadness, the excitement and disappointments that we do every day. He is the perfect man, but a man who is always there for us, who can sympathize with us and be the one unfailing friend to whom we can go in prayer. And above all else, Jesus is the one who became man to suffer the agony of death for us. After living his perfect life of love and obedience and struggling with the temptations and torments in the garden, he surrendered himself to the Father's will and he offered his human body and soul upon that cross to accomplish the Father's purpose for us so that we should live in everlasting fellowship with God and be fully restored to the image of our Heavenly Father according to his definite plan. Peter goes on to reveal that Jesus is also the very Son of God who conquered death. When the apostle addressed the crowds, he showed that Jesus was more than any ordinary man by reminding them of all that Christ had said and done while he was with them. The words he spoke were not from men and the works he performed were not human. They were divine. The apostle said that Jesus was accredited by God through mighty works and wonders and signs. Turning water into wine, feeding thousands on a few fish and loaves of bread, stopping the wind and calming the seas, giving sight to the blind and hearing to the deaf, making the lame to walk and the mute to speak, casting out demons, even giving life to the dead. All these things declared that Jesus was more than a man. They were clear signs that he was the promised Christ and the son of the living God. Jesus is the one of whom David spoke centuries earlier in the Psalms when as a prophet he declared the plan that God had revealed to him. Along with all the prophets, David knew that the Holy One of God was coming into the world to save God's people from their sins. Before the the humanity of Jesus was created in the womb of Mary, he had always been the true, uncreated, and only begotten Son who lived and reigned with the Father and the Holy Spirit as one God from eternity. When he became man, none of this was lost or altered, but as the Bible tells us, the fullness of God dwelt in him in bodily form. This is how much the Father loves us. He sent his only begotten Son to become the atoning sacrifice for our sin so that all who believe in him will not perish, but have eternal life. And because of of who Jesus was, it was possible, it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. He was not just a man who died on a cross, but God in the flesh who willingly laid down his life for the friends he loves, for all of us. And as Lord of life, he also had the authority not only to lay down his life, but also then to take it up again. As David foretold, God the Father would not let his son see decay, but raised him up so that he could conquer death. Through his resurrection, Jesus has now destroyed the power of death over every one of us. His promise is that because he lives, we shall live also. Even now, through the life-giving waters of baptism, we have already crossed over from death to a new and eternal life with God. The blood of Christ has cleansed us from our sins and begun the restoration of God's image in us, who are the masterpieces of his creation. And the last thing that our epistle tells us is that Jesus is the Lord and Christ who pours out 
the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. Peter proclaims to the people of Jerusalem, to us, that this same Jesus, who is the Son of God, who fulfilled his Father's purpose, has now been exalted to the right hand of God in heaven, and there he lives and reigns with all a power and authority to bless us. Jesus has conquered all his enemies, and he's placed them under his feet so that we may share in his victory and inherit the kingdom of heaven with him. Jesus is bigger and stronger than anything we will ever encounter in our lives. No matter what anyone personally does with him, God has made Jesus both Lord and Christ. The people to whom Jesus first came did not make much of him. He was not the kind of Christ they wanted, the kind who would offer them a worldly kingdom of glory, victory over all their enemies, and promise them temporal wealth and success. In the end, they rejected him. They mocked and ridiculed him. They even crucified him. But none of this could change who Jesus was, is, and will forever be. He is the Lord, Yahweh, the promised Christ, anointed to be our savior and everlasting king. Still today, there are those who have no use for a savior like Jesus and a God who would die on a cross for them. Even we are guilty of making far too little of Jesus and the kingdom he offers us. We demand what he has not promised and reject what he does offer. Like the crowds who listened to Peter, we have mocked, ridiculed, and crucified him over and over again by our sin, getting our spray cans out and marking everything up again and again. But what you or I or the world thinks about him cannot change who he really is. Jesus is the Lord and Christ who loves us, who died and rose again for us, who reigns for us in heaven. And Jesus is the one who now pours out upon us the Holy Spirit. Jesus promised his disciples that after his ascension, he would send the Holy Spirit, the comforter, who would lead them into all truth and take all that he had purchased for them and all that he had done for them and give it to them. At the first Pentecost, Jesus poured out the Holy Spirit upon his disciples in a special way. You heard about that last week, how they were how they heard what sounded like roaring wind and saw tongues of fire descending and resting upon them and how they were given the gift of speaking the gospel in every language with great boldness to all the people who were gathered there. And the result was that many were brought to repentance and were saved. Jesus continues to be the one who pours out the Holy Spirit upon all of us even today. Just as with the crowds who heard the gospel and received the blessings of baptism and the Lord's Supper, the Holy Spirit comes to us through the word and the sacraments. Like the crowds to whom Peter spoke, we are cut to the heart when our sins against Christ are uncovered. Yet we are also comforted when directed to the cleansing waters of baptism. When the Holy Spirit enters our hearts because our ears have heard the sweet words of forgiveness and when we are invited to taste our salvation in the Lord's Supper. On this feast of the Holy Trinity, let us confess to all the world who Jesus really is. He is the perfect man who fulfilled the purpose of God the Father to save us. He is God the Son who conquered death for us. And he is the Lord and Christ who pours out God the Holy Spirit upon us every time we gather. Thanks be to God, amen. And now the peace of God that surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting, amen. This being Trinity Sunday, we will recite the Athanasian Creed. Whoever desires to be saved must above all hold the Catholic faith. Whoever does not keep it whole and undefiled will without doubt perish eternally. And the Catholic faith is this, that we worship one God in Trinity and Trinity in unity, neither confusing the persons nor dividing the substance. For the Father is one person, the Son is another, and the Holy Spirit is another. But the Godhead of of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit is one, the glory equal, the majesty co-eternal. 
Such as the Father is, such is the Son, and such is the Holy Spirit. The Father uncreated, the Son uncreated, the Holy Spirit uncreated, the Father infinite, the Son infinite, the Holy Spirit infinite, the Father eternal, the Son eternal, the Holy Spirit eternal. And yet there are not three eternals, but one eternal, just as there are not three uncreated or three infinites, but one uncreated and one infinite. In the same way, the Father is almighty, the Son almighty, the Holy Spirit almighty, and yet there are not three almighties, but one almighty. So the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God, and yet there are not three gods, but one God. So the Father is Lord, the Son is Lord, the Holy Spirit is Lord, and yet there are not three lords, but one Lord. Just as we are compelled by the Christian truth to acknowledge each distinct person as God and Lord, so also are we prohibited by the Catholic religion to say that there are three gods or lords. The Father is not made nor created nor begotten by anyone. The Son is neither made nor created but begotten of the Father alone. The Holy Spirit is of the Father and of the Son, neither made nor created nor begotten but proceeding. Thus there is one Father, not three fathers, one Son, not three sons, one Holy Spirit, not three Holy Spirits. And in this Trinity, none is before or after another, none is greater or less than another, but the whole three persons are co-eternal with each other and co-equal, so that in all things, as has been stated above, the Trinity and unity and unity in Trinity is to be worshiped. Therefore, whoever desires to be saved must think thus about the Trinity. But it is also necessary for everlasting salvation that one faithfully believe the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is the right faith that we believe and confess that our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is at the same time both God and man. He is God begotten from the substance of the Father before all ages, and he is man born from the substance of his mother in this age. Perfect God and perfect man composed of a rational soul and human flesh, equal to the Father with respect to his divinity, less than the Father with respect to his humanity. Although he's God and man, he is not two, but one Christ. One, however, not by the conversion of the divinity into flesh, but by the assumption of the humanity into God. One altogether, not by confusion of substance, but by unity of person. For as the rational soul and flesh is one man, so God and man is one Christ, who suffered for our salvation, descended into hell, rose again the third day from the dead, ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father, God Almighty, from whence he will come to judge the living and the dead. At his coming, all people will rise again with their bodies and give an account concerning their own deeds. And those who have done good will enter into eternal life, and those who have done evil into eternal fire. This is the Catholic faith. Whoever does not believe it faithfully and firmly cannot be saved. We continue with our prayers. Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And the Lord be with you and with your spirit. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you have given us grace to acknowledge the glory of the eternal Trinity by the confession of a true faith and to worship the unity and the power of the divine majesty. Keep us steadfast in this faith and defend us from all adversities. For you, O Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, live and reign one God now and forever. Amen. In the beginning, Father, Your word spoke all things into being, and from nothing you made all that is. Help us to see the imprint of your love in the goodness of creation and to exercise responsible care uh, of all that you have entrusted to us. 
Grants us especially to Scott and Amber, Henry and Susan, Chris and Sue, and Fred and Nancy who celebrate their anniversaries, that they may cherish and defend this blessed gift. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Throughout the ages, Father, your spirit filled the sin-damaged world with hope and called us to repentance and faith. Help us along with Alice, Bill, and Deborah, and Duane and Nancy to hear the voice of your word and to respond with faith, confessing you without fear before all manner of people and in every corner of the earth. As you planned long ago, the, the world began. Deliver us in Christ that we may be your own and live according to your commands all our days. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In this day and in this time, Father, raise up for your church godly men like James Batchelder, who serves St. Paul Lutheran Church of Manitou, to serve as pastors. Bless us with faithful church workers and missionaries like David and Shelley and Kayla and Adam and Christine to make known your saving gospel. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In government and law, Father, you work to establish and preserve order, protecting the weak and fostering godly virtue. Bless our president, our governor, all law enforcement officers and first responders in these difficult days of hatred and unrest. Deliver the world from the threats of the pandemic and tyranny and preserve the nations in peace. Bless all who defend us in the armed forces, hinder those who oppress any people with mistrust, violence, mistruth or fear. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In the hour of trial, in the moment of trouble, you are there, Father. Hear us as we cry to you for the sake of the sick, the troubled in mind and the wounded in heart and spirit. We pray especially for Sandy, Larry, and Terry, Steve, Cindy, Peg, and David, Chris, Jackie, and Kathleen, and Michael and Kevin who are ill or hospitalized. Deliver them from affliction as you, uh, according to your will and sustain them in hope with a patient heart and strength for, for the day. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In the company of the saints, Father, you have shown us that you will not abandon your people but will keep them to everlasting life. Grant comfort to the family of Jim Hansen who has finished his hard run of race and grant them peace through the promises offered through your Son, our Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, you have safely brought us to the beginning of this day. Defend us in the same with your mighty power and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings being ordered by your governance may be righteous in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. This concludes our worship. I pray the Lord's blessings to you. Uh, please keep an eye out uh, because we will, in addition to our drive-in service next week, which we're moving to 8.30, we will begin to have services here in the sanctuary also at 10 o'clock. Lord's blessings.